welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have an action-packed show coming right up. And our first guests are Mark and Angel Chernoff. And they're here to talk to us about their new book, Getting Back to Happy. So have you ever wondered what it'd be like to just be authentically happy? And is it really something that can be obtained? Well, Mark and Angel are the creators of Mark and Angel's Hack Life, which was recognized by Forbes as one of the most popular personal development blogs. Through their writings, coachings, and live events, they spent the past decade sharing proven strategies for getting unstuck in order to find lasting happiness and success. So let's welcome to the show, Mark and Angel. Thank you so much. It's thrilled to be here. Thank you for having us. Oh, what a joy to have you both here. And what a great book. My goodness. You know, once I picked it up, I could not put it down. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that. that. We appreciate it. It's not often we get a, um, a duo like this that writes such a profound book. Why don't you share with us what was the inspiration behind this book? What, what got you guys started on the path of getting back to happy? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll start off. Um, so about 10 years ago, uh, we were in our late 20s at the time. Um, we were not into happiness and personal development, and we ran into a series of losses that all happened back-to-back. Uh, we had a, a mutual best friend, someone near and dear to our heart, Josh, uh, passed away. Uh, it was a, an asthma attack. He had never had a severe asthma attack before. He was on a work trip, and in a hotel room alone, um, he passed away. Uh, it was an asthma attack led to a heart attack, and he was gone uh, without any answers, leaving behind his uh, wife and his two children, who are dear friends of ours as well. Um, as we were dealing with that, that reality, um, trying to figure out and, and struggling to figure out, you know, why that would happen, we were, you know, all the shoulda, woulda, couldas, um, Angel's brother uh, took his own life. And he was the, you know, he was the rock of, of the family. He was kind of like that go-to, the strong guy you go to when you have problems. And, um, and so, I mean, these two losses back-to-back, in the downturn of the economy, we lose our jobs. Um, this was just the low point in our lives. It's kind of the, the, the basic, you know, that, that, that's it. I mean, all details aside, like we were, we were depressed, um, individually and yet living under one roof. Um, we stopped socializing with, with others. We stopped talking to each other. Um, it started with sadness and tears, of course, but it led to emptiness, that kind of feeling of depression, of just nothingness. Uh, and we sat there for several months, um, till we were able to have a conversation with ourselves. Uh, it was it basically it w- amounted to the fact that we needed to start taking steps forward. Like what we were doing was no longer working. Um, grieving is important, surely, um, but we weren't doing it in a healthy way anymore. You know, we were certainly choosing to disassociate ourselves from everything. And so we started a ritual uh, that every day at the same time, we were living out in San Diego at the time, and we would leave the house and walk down the boardwalk over to an area called Sail Bay. There was a little green space there. And we'd bring personal development books with us. So we would bring uh, Byron Katie, Eckhart Tolle, uh, Wayne Dyer, you know, both Christian and Eastern philosophy. And we would read by ourselves, but together um, we'd be reading different books. And then we would, we would share what we were learning. And that is, what the, that is actually the, the, the start of the blog. We started the blog to be a public accountability journal um, because, you know, the, the best lessons that we learn in life are the lessons we learn again and again. And that is especially true when we're struggling. Like, we need to be reminded um, to, to take the right steps forward. And so we started this blog literally as a place to, to distill what we were learning, share it with each other, and hold ourselves accountable so it was a point of reference. And, of course, there's a big black box between then and now. But needless to say that people start, people found it via social media. Other people like found it via Google and then started sharing it on, you know, Twitter and Facebook and so forth. We start getting comments and, and emails and people saying like, listen, I really resonate with your story. Um, let me tell you my story. What do you think I should do? Like this strategy worked for me. Like, like, and, and we, from there we started, um, kind of like group support, like support groups, um, that were free to join people sharing stories. And out of that was born, of course, um, writing books and, and doing coaching. We, you know, several, a few years later, we decided, you know, this is, this is something we need to step into. Um, it was just kind of like something we were doing on the side for the longest time. And, and then here we are. I mean, uh, just over 10 years later, um, getting back to happy, the book is an account of kind of our beginnings and then taking you through the, the tools, tips, and strategies, specifically the daily rituals, the little things that we need to do on a daily basis 
that will help us step through challenging situations. And it doesn't have to be just loss and grief. I mean, challenging situations with job loss or just feeling stuck, feeling generally stuck like you don't know what, what, where to go from here. Um, and you have to do that consistently, right? It, it, quick inspiration doesn't work. Um, that can be helpful, but even the quick inspiration has to be a daily ritual, right? Reminding yourself consistently. Um, and so that, that is, that is really, the book is a catalog of our story and, and the tools, tips, and strategies that we leverage for ourselves and for others since. And it's such a beautiful story. I mean, it's, and I think that's why so many people can relate because you've got tragedy that happens. I mean, I think we all know somebody that, had something tragic happen, people that have, um, I, I've had a friend that was killed when I was young. And so you, you look at these things and then sometimes getting back to a place where you're starting to feel like you're living again can be really tough. None of, none of us are, are immune to life stresses, right? Each and every one of us have had a bad day, a bad moment, and maybe a, a, a season of hardship. So none of us are immune to this. So th- this, book's, this book helps break down the actual steps that you can take to get to a better place, to get where you feel more like yourself again. Often do you get people writing you going, gosh, I just feel stuck. I don't know how I'm going to get beyond this place. And then you guys would pick up certain situations that are happening that you're hearing among the people that are writing you and blog about that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I tell you, you know, it, it, what's interesting is in personal development, just as a, as a study, let's say, um, you know, the same, it's the same strategies and tools and, and tips remixed in different ways, right? But, it, but there's, a, there's a baseline of consistency there. And one of the most beautiful parts of our, our job is that we talk to people, like you're saying, and we hear people's stories, and we can apply these tools and, sh- and strategies to various circumstances. And that actually inspires us. I tell you, you know, there was a period in our lives, as I said, where we were, we were stuck, and we were doing this out of necessity. But after you know, being over a decade into it, you start, you know, you, you might look at like, you're like, oh, you're talking about happiness again, you're talking about success again, but it's not the same because everybody has a different story. And when you apply these same tools and strategies to different life stories, I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, it really is remarkable how, how people respond and, 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 and what they feel and what they go through. I mean, everything from, I mean, you know, as a cliche thing to say, like, you know, you're, you're feeling stuck. I mean, and, and you don't feel like anything's going well in your life, you can you know, talk about gratitude, right? Everyone talks about gratitude, and you might brush it off, but if you are consistent with gratitude, not gratitude one day and, oh, that, that was nice, but like if you sit down every evening for three minutes and you just reflect on three things that went well during your day, right? It could be simple. I made it home safely from work today. I have a spouse I love. Little things like that. You do that consistently for six months, and it changes the trajectory of your life because you start resonating and, and identifying yourself with these little silver linings, and you start seeing more of them in your life, and it changes the way you feel. Um, and, and, you, and obviously, you don't want to bypass the fact that there's negative days too, right? So if you're feeling stuck, you, know, you also have to address that. You don't want to say, okay, positivity is, is where it's at all the time. No, you're allowed to be, be emotional. You're allowed to be negative. You're allowed to not feel good. We all have bad days. But if you're feeling consistently stressed out, you're feeling that anxiety, you're feeling like, oh, I, like nothing's going well, you need to start paying attention to that, that feeling and realizing how that's affecting you. And maybe a great way of doing that would also be writing it down. Um, it works very well for a lot of people where you literally interrupt your thoughts. So, you know, you, you catch yourself with that anxiety in your, 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 your head, feeling a certain way. Pause. Take 60 seconds, doesn't have to be long, and just do literally like a raw brain dump. Like get that thought out of your head, write it down somewhere. It could be in a phone, iPad, or just, you know, analog, a pen and paper, and, and record your thoughts throughout the week. Anytime you catch yourself feeling stressed, just pause and do it. And don't judge yourself for it. Don't try to evaluate it in that moment. Just use the, the process of recording that ritual as an interrupt. You're interrupting the thought, you're getting it down, you're, you're, you're bringing your focus to it, and you're putting it down someplace. Now, once a week, Go back and open up that journal of thoughts. Just read through them. And do this when you're feeling calm and collected, maybe like a Saturday morning when you have no, nothing else on your plate and you have some time to dedicate to yourself. And open up that journal of thoughts. And it might sound ridiculous, right, because you're going to sit down and you're going to take a look at the worst, some of the worst moments in your week. But you do that consistently and you start to see patterns in the way you're thinking, the way you're feeling at certain moments. You see similarities between how things at work stress you out and things at home stress you out. And then you can grab one of the thoughts, maybe the thought that stresses you out the most, and you can start to question those thoughts. You can start to take a deeper look at them um, because there's a story there, 
right? And it doesn't mean that the story's false. In some cases, it might be a complete fantasy if you think something should be the way it's not. Um, but sometimes the pain from the past, losing somebody, some tough hardship will affect the way you're perceiving any moment. And so maybe the story's not completely false, but you have to ask yourself, like, if, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, um, you know, uh, let, let's say I'm not good enough for these people, right? You're in a meeting and you're feeling inferior. Or you're about to head into a, a boardroom and you're feeling inferior, going on a job interview fe- and feeling like not enough. Um, that's a great, I mean, that, 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 that there is a very common thought that a lot of us have. And so you, you, you recorded it, be, be detailed about it, you know, 60 seconds, get a few sentences down. Now you're sitting there on a Saturday morning and you, you can ask yourself, like, is that, is that really accurate that I'm not enough? Can I think of some examples in my life where I am enough? Like, what, what is the opposite of I'm not enough? Like, I am enough. And let's think of some examples of that. And even if, if you've had failures in the past, right, and you say, well, you can point to that and say, well, there, there's the example of why I'm not enough. Well, is that the whole truth? Like, is that all that's true? Because it doesn't mean that you haven't had hardships and you haven't had failures, but where the success is, right? A lot of times when we're, feel, when we're focused on the negative, we're so narrowly focused. We have tunnel vision, right? We're missing everything in the periphery. And so, you know, by doing a consistent ritual of evaluating, like looking at both the positive silver linings in your life and looking at the tough moments and those, those moments of anxiety and stress, by doing it consistently and doing it with an open mind, um, slowly, it's not easy, right? It can be painful to look at the painful stuff, but you, you do it slowly and consistently, you accept it, you sit with it, and you become more of a master of it. So rather than those thoughts controlling you, you start being able to work through them. Um, and, and through that, it gives you a level of awareness and a level of freedom and also a, a, a mastery of, what, of, of how you think. And so, it, it, again, it's a practice that, you know, you know, a few months down the road, you have some of those same feelings like, I'm not enough. And you're like, ah, I've seen this before, right? I've worked on this many times. And so you start entering that moment with that confidence of understanding how that's affecting you. But it doesn't come instantly. That takes work, and that takes writing it down, recording it, and then reviewing it later and becoming a master of it in that way. Well, you both really blaze a trail for people who are looking to get to the next level. And I love, and you mentioned this just a minute ago, um, in regards to rituals, and you kind of went over, you know, some of the things to do in regards to one of the rituals, and you even have bulletproof rituals, which I think some people are like, I need that. That's what I need because I've maybe I've done a little bit here and there, but I'm not consistent. And I love how you bring that consistency part in. Yes, and it doesn't have to be big either. You know, the ritual can be small. We want it to be so small that it actually seems silly. Why would you implement this? But the ritual, you want you want to identify. You want this to be your new normal. So what are some things that you can implement and what are some tactics that can help to keep this in your life? And, you know, think about, think about you know, brushing your teeth, right? That's normal. You just do that. You don't even think twice about it. So if, you, if you're trying to get healthy, um, if, you, if you're trying to exercise more, it can be as simple as like, okay, I'm going to walk around the block once a day, you know, whether that's a five minute, something small, five minutes, and if five minutes is too long, break it down to three minutes. But it's like just something small, so small that it seems silly that you want to do it. Right. In the beginning, consistency is more important than duration. And we always get that wrong. Like everyone, we always try to bite off more with it than we can chew. I'm going to start a workout routine and I'm going to work out for an hour a day. And it's like, well, you know. That's, that's a dream in the beginning, but you can get there. I'm not, we're not saying you can't, but like Angel said, man, you, you gotta, it, most people, 15 minutes almost feels like too much. It's a burden to get there. It's a burden to, to take that jog or that walk. Um, so do it for five, do it for 10, do it for, make the barrier for entry so low that it, it, it's just not, it doesn't make any sense not to do it. Um, and do that consistently for, you know, 60 days or so, which is about the time it takes to kind of develop a human habit, and then inch it upwards. And like Angel said, that's your new normal. So now getting out the door for, for 10 minutes doesn't feel so bad. So now you can notch it up to 12 minutes, right? And it's, it's you're slowly adjusting the, what's normal to you and what feels okay. Um, and that's, I mean, that's how progress is made. Well, I love your guys' book so much. I have all these little tabs and notes going on. Of course, we're never going to touch all of it because people obviously need to get their own copy of Getting Back to Happy. But, um, <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'm just delighted we get to spend this time together. And, and you know, you talk about mindfulness in your book. And what kind of part does that have to play in the bigger picture of getting back to happy? 
Yeah, I, mindfulness is very important because mindfulness is, you know, we, we, we say that it's about acceptance. You know, no matter what is going on, we can fight the battles of today. It's when you add on the infinite battles of yesterday and tomorrow that life gets overly complicated. So it's accepting where you're at now, being faithful in the now, being faithful in the now and understanding that everything you are going through, good and bad, is preparing you for the next best thing. Right. And that, and that like Angel said, is acceptance is kind of the key foundation. Um, it doesn't mean you want it to be that way. It doesn't mean that it will always be that way. But you have to respect the present moment for what it is without wishing it were any different. You have to see and look for the silver linings that exist there without holding on to them so tight when they when things change because, of course, things are going to change, right? And if you're holding on tight, you're gonna, it's, it's going to drag you down. Um, and at the same time, you, you've got to be able to cope and, and, and respect the struggles that exist in the present um, without holding on too tight to those, right? And believing that it will always be that way because it won't. Again, everything changes. Um, and that is mindfulness, really. I mean, that's, that, that is, that's the foundation. Simple to say, like, always simple to say, right? And harder to do. The practice of noticing, the practice of, you know, sitting with yourself in a moment of stress and not trying to solve all the problems, but just sitting there and saying, you know, this is the way I'm feeling, uh, bringing the awareness to it, the way you feel in your, your, your mind and your heart and your body, um, that's, I mean, that can be the start, uh, mm-hmm. but it has to be done consistently. Recognizing your thoughts, but not attaching to them, not believing them, letting them, uh, acknowledging them, but not, uh, not believing them that that is all that's true. Right. Hmm. Well, and isn't it, I mean, it just kind of, makes me think about how often people will hold on to negative, you know, negative thoughts, negative events, and have that going, gosh, things are never going to change or never turn around. And your book really is a testament to being able to make that happen, to make those changes. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, when, 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 when our thoughts are in the gutter, we're going to see more of it, right? What we focus on, what we pay attention to grows. And that goes for both ways, positive and negative. So you want to you want to control those thoughts. You want to control what you're thinking and what what you're thinking. You will see more of in life. You know, one thing that I really love is a loving kindness meditation, and it's just a series of statements that you say to yourself, and it sets the day for you to see more of it in your life. And so, for example, just repeating these statements to yourself: May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe, may I be at ease, and may I be loved. And so you can do that same loving kindness meditation, repeat that three times to yourself, and then also you can do it with different different people. Like imagine there is someone in your life who you need to forgive or someone mm-hmm. you have a lot of pain and resentment towards. You can do that same loving kindness meditation with them as a subject. You know, for me, it was my biological mother. I did, I, I did those statements with her, and so I did, you know, May Barbara Ann be loved. May Barbara Ann be happy. May Barbara Ann be safe. May Barbara Ann be at ease. And so just doing that, like you can imagine, you know, it's hard, but it's just thinking those thoughts, you know, tears were running down my face. And it it, it just sets the stage for what you're repeating to yourself and what you're thinking you're going to see more of in your life. Yeah. It's a beautiful process. It's, you know, Again, you do that once, there's some tears, you do that consistently, and it brings up new thoughts. Um, it brings up uh, new awareness to this other human being that's out there that you have resentment and hatred towards, uh, you know, these the, the circumstances that, that you, you believe are the worst. Um, and, it, you know, bringing it back to Angel's point on acceptance, you know, that is, that's ultimately what it brings you back to. It, it, the awareness leads into the acceptance, and it doesn't mean that you have to say, oh, you know, the, Things have to be, you know, things have to be perfect or, or, or you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm just going to give up and be complacent about the situation I'm in. I'm going to let this person behave and treat me poorly. It's not about that at all. It's about getting to the position where you're in control of the negative. So if there's somebody who's, who's being toxic in your life, to be angry, right, to, to, to be filled with rage and hatred um, is, is really 
not going to serve you. I mean, if anything, you're going to be behaving as bad as they are. Um, you're going to be attacking them for attacking you, you know, and that is going to stress you out to no end. But if you can get to the point where you you have a, a, a level of kind of presence and awareness about you, um, and you've kind of practiced using a tool like Angel just mentioned, um, that puts you in a position of power, right, where you can actually communicate more effectively. You can choose to walk away with your dignity, with your head held high. You can choose to have a conversation that you would otherwise not choose to have um, because you believed it was impossible. So, I mean, when you leverage, you know, little daily rituals um, to to deal with your present circumstances, the relationships you have and so forth, it, wants, it, it just it puts you more into the present moment and more into a position of power within it so that you can make decisions effectively. You, you, are, you are being, um, you are no longer being reactive, right? You are, you, are, you are responding mindfully and effectively to your present circumstances as opposed to just like snapping, um, which, is, which is what we all do, right? And, and that's why it's a practice because Angel and I aren't above this. I mean, if something bad happens, of course, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna respond to it in a negative way. I'll use a, a real great example. Um, I was taking a jog with Angel recently off-road, trail running, and I heard a loud pop come from my foot. And I tell you, it was loud. It's not like a tree branch breaking. I immediately knew something was not right. We walked. We were luckily pretty close to the car. I uh, got x-rays the next day. It was a, it's called a Jones fracture, broken fifth metatarsal. It's one of the slowest healing fractures in the human body. An average fracture takes six to eight weeks. This thing, 12 to 16 or not at all. Um, I'm about five weeks into it now, still on crutches. Um, when that happened... I mean, my mind, of course, was like I was angry. I was in pain, physical pain. But then I start to think about it, right? You have to bring your awareness back to the present. Listen, the reality of it is I have this fractured foot. The do- I, I've seen x-rays. It's, that's, the, that's real. To wish, to believe it shouldn't have happened, to do the shoulda, woulda, coulda is going to ruin the next 16 weeks of my life. It's going to make, it's going to make me ineffective at everything I do. To embrace the fact that I will be on crutches for 16 weeks, to say, this is okay, I have a foot that's going to heal, to say, you know what, let me, you know, I can't move my body as much, so I'm going to have to change my diet. Let me look at the positive side, like I can start eating healthier. I, I, can, I can leverage this as kind of the gateway to, to change my, 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 my eating habits. Um, and I, I just started focusing on more of the positive aspects of things. My, my work, obviously, as a coach and as a writer and author, deals with my hands and my head a lot more than my legs. So, I mean, there's another silver lining. And so, again, but it took me sitting down with myself over the course of many days and even weeks to, to kind of get to the point where I'm in full acceptance of it. it's fine. And, of course, you know, a hurt foot, it's, it's a minor thing in the grand scheme of things, but those are the kind of things that blindside us and, and, and bring us down. And it's very easy, you know, especially like a foot, like we walk around as human beings, so, like, that changes a lot. Um, it's very easy to let that get the best of you. And so with consistent practice, you can, you can step through those kinds of struggles. Uh, and, and, and you just, again, like Angel said, consistency, consistency. Just remind yourself. Look at those silver linings. Work through those, ne- through those negative thoughts. Do the loving kindness meditation. Not once, but daily. Remind yourself. Let those lessons you are learning be the ones you learn again and again so that it keeps you kind of with the right foot pointed forward. Yeah, I, I think the reason so many people resonate with you guys is probably because you, you know, you're you're going through the same situations that so many people are having, and you talk about things like, hey, I'm dealing with negative thoughts. I, you know, broke my, you know, broke this bone in my foot, and I'm having to deal with that. But you also, and you talk about this in your book about how you reframe things. So you're you're actually the one that's in control, as you were discussing. Mm-hmm. You know, none of us are immune to life stressors, and I think all of us, we, we, want, we want to be heard, and we want to know that we're not alone, you know, so we're right there with you, and so we're working with these rituals and implementing them and changing our perspective, you know, that, that's the key, is how to change your perspective and how to see the silver lining in the situation, because no matter what you're going through, there is going to be a silver lining. You can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can always connect them looking backwards. So it's while you're in the midst, while you're in the storm, while you're going through the hardship and the pain, know that whatever you are going through is necessary and it is preparing you for the next best thing. Yeah, I mean, I tell you what, Angel and I, um, we were lucky enough to be on the Megan Kelly uh, Today Show uh, this past Monday. And we were sitting in a hotel room in Manhattan getting ready to go over and, and be on her show. It was a fantastic interview. And 
it was remarkable in that moment that we suddenly we just had this this conversation about how losing Josh and Todd and our and, and, and struggling financially and having all of that stuff happen uh you know over ten years ago. Uh you connected we can connect the dots from those painful, painful life changes to that moment of being in, in, in New York City about to go on to the Megan Kelly show, right? I mean, there is literally a direct line if you trace the dots between these two circumstances. And and it's and it, it doesn't happen overnight, right? I mean, but it, it, it's wild to look at the, like, when you literally take the worst situations in your life and you study them and you leverage them to inspire you to take positive and consistent action, you change everything. And you are in control of those things. You are in control of how you respond to life. And it might sound like a cliche. It might seem like, oh, no way that this applies to somebody else and not to my life, right? They can do it, but I can't. Mm-hmm. We, we all, you know, we definitely all have baseline levels of happiness. Not everyone's as happy as everybody else. We all come from different backgrounds. So certainly, you know, they're, like some, some of us are more privileged, let's say, than others. Um, but we can work within the boundaries that we, that we have, and we can actually break through those boundaries slowly and consistently. Um, it takes effort. You've got to do the hard things to be happy in life, right? The things that nobody else can do for you, the things that make you scared, the things that make you question just how much longer you can push forward, because those are the things that ultimately define you. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between you know existing and, and, and just saying, okay, this is just how it's going to be forever. And actually living and finding more peace and more happiness and more success and more satisfaction and progress in your life. Mm-hmm. In, in your response is your power. You know, nothing is good or bad as your thinking makes it so. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's a, that's a that's a, mm-hmm. a quote that we reference <laughs> all the time. Yeah, it's it's like literally a mantra in our household. You know, it. it but you've got to remind yourself. And Angel, I think Angel said, you know, have faith in the now earlier. That's something we constantly bring ourselves back to. Have faith in the now, right? Don't worry. Like the next moment will take care of your, itself as long as you take care of this one really well. Um, and so often we're just not even paying attention to it. Paying attention to what's happening or what's going on with that at all. My goodness, no. Well, and um, I know that, I mean, your book's available everywhere. People can get Getting Back to Happy anywhere that books are sold. Where can they connect with the both of you and be part of your community? Yeah, we would uh, we would love for you to visit our blog. It's at markandangel.com, and that's Mark with a C, M-A-R-C. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Just search for Mark and Angel. Perfect. Well, do you know, Mark and Angel, thank you both so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Great. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, we're truly grateful. Very appreciative. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark and Angel. It's been such a joy to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your new book, Getting Back to Happy. If you'd like to purchase the book, it's available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and all major retailers. And if you'd like to learn more about Mark and Angel, of course, visit their website, markandangel.com. I'm following them on social media and highly suggest you do the same. Well, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We're going to be right back after these messages with special guest, Joan K. Lacey. And she's going to be talking with us today about her new novel. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. 
For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted to be introducing our next guest for today, Joan K. Lacey, and she's here to talk to us about her new book, A Shadow Away. Joan is a weaver of words, ancient cultures, mysteries, and adventures. Raised in the country outside of San Diego, an adventurous spirit encouraged her to take every opportunity to explore all this fascinating world has to offer. Joan now combines her love of archaeology, history, and fantasy fiction with her active imagination to create a world filled of all sorts of magic and adventure. Ooh, doesn't that sound good? So let's welcome to the show Joan Lacey. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Oh, what a pleasure it is to have you here. And so what an exciting book you have, my goodness. I mean, once I got my hands on it, I couldn't put it down. Oh, thank you. Yes, I, I do have fun writing the adventure story, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> well, and so let's talk about this for a moment because I'm always so curious, and we get lots of letters from people around the world that ask, like, what inspires authors to write the books they do? So why don't you share a little bit about that with us? Okay. Well, the the inspiration for that story, the first one, A Shadow Away, which now has turned into a series, it became a part of my experience of writing because uh, I've, I, I have a vivid imagination. I love a good adventure story. And I've learned a lot of things over the years from archaeology to metaphysics and science. And I just wanted to put them all together and write about that. Well, and so in, in your journey through all this, were you involved a lot in archaeology? That kind of is where you're pulling that information from? I studied it in school at uh, UCLA, no, well, at San Diego State, and it's always been an interest. I've always been interested in art and science. So I've studied quantum physics, and I found that magic at its basic level is a lot like quantum physics, where all our laws of physics break down, and actually magic happens in our world, too. So... Mm -hmm. No, that's all, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and so in writing a novel, you bring a lot of that magic to it, and that's drawing from the uh, metaphysics and and just the that part of your life that's kind of opened up. Yes. Well, my my life has actually been magical, and I didn't appreciate it until I went away to college. Uh, I had a great life growing up as a kid. We lived out in the country. My parents were very supportive and believed in me and told me and my sister that we can accomplish whatever we set out to do, and we believed them. So um, so magic happens, and a lot of magic happens when people just call them coincidence, because in the world of metaphysics, there's no such thing as a coincidence. Everything happens for a reason. So when things come into our life, I'll say my life, I'll take it to myself. Mm -hmm. When something happens to me, I have to look around and say, okay, well, why did I draw that to me, whether it was good fortune or bad? Because we have lessons to learn even from the unfortunate things that happen to us because 
there's always a lesson for us somewhere in our experiences in life. Oh, isn't that the truth? And I love how you have so much, um, well, you know, just for uh, kind of a blanket purpose, we'll call it magic, that's just kind of wrapped up in your stories because it makes it feel like you've really stepped into another world. That's exactly what I wanted to create. Um, so thank you for saying that, Marianne. Um, I'd like to draw pictures with words so that I can draw people into another world and let them lose themselves in their own imaginations and the world they create. And um, so that that was something I wanted to do because so many novels today, when I was researching, because I wanted to do background study and Research is kind of fun because you learn a lot of interesting facts along the way. But what I found out about a lot of kids, especially for teens um, and young people, there's no really positive adult role models. So I wanted to create characters that I love, characters that people would want to be with and and, uh, conversations they'd want to get involved in so that uh, they'd have an alternative to... um, dystopian worlds and stressed characters where they could just live in a, a world of magic and where, where things do work out for the best. And uh, also with that, then because I love travel in foreign languages and other cultures, I bring those into my stories too so that people can learn something about this world and its people and their cultures. Well, and uh, for our listeners that don't know, I mean, you know quite a few languages, right? Well, yes, I've languages came easy to me. So to me, uh, it was very simple, not simple because you have to work at it, but it wasn't so difficult that I couldn't do it. So I studied French and Spanish all through high school, and I lived in Mexico City with a family and went to school at the Ibero-American University, and my classes were taught in Spanish. So by after I had four years of Spanish by then, so I could conjugate verbs really great. But living in the uh, in the culture and being with the people every day and having to make myself be understood one way or the other, figuring out the words that I did know to make what I needed un- understood. So I, uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed that. And that's the thing about traveling is when people – even try to learn a few words of the language of the country they're in, the people who live there appreciate it so much, and they open up, and they're so friendly, and it really made for some wonderful experiences. Well, you can see that you bring that adventure into this book. It's really interwoven with that magic, and so it helps people to kind of you know, kind of travel, maybe they're at home and they, you know, traveling, going on into a, to another country isn't really something that's available to them. But man, they can do it with your book. <laughs> that's great. I'm so happy. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, why don't we talk about your writing process? Because I know with writers, everything's a little different. So what is your writing process? What does that look like? Well, the first thing I do is since I enjoy myths and legends, that's what I want to wrap my stories around. So I have a few favorite legends, like the first is El Dorado. And even today, people are searching for El Dorado, and there's still expeditions on TV and, and uh, Adventure Channel, and which I love to watch, as well as the Science Channel. Um, I get a lot of tips for ideas for books from those kind of stations and magazines. And um, so I do my research. So I chose El Dorado, for example. So that would take place somewhere in uh, South America or Central America. Nobody knows. So I'm free to set the the book where I want. And I've always uh, loved Chichen Itza and the uh, Tikal, the pyramids that are down in Belize in Yucatan. So that's where I set the book. And so the story is Alex, who's an adventurer and Andrew, who's an archaeologist, they uh, get together and team up to chase down a hunt for a gold statue that has mysteriously disappeared. And so that's what this story is, is around. It's shaped around that that particular myth. The, the second story uh, will take place in ancient China. 
because I've, I've always been interested in China and the first emperor, who some people believe is a myth that never existed. Mm-hmm. And he did actually, 20, 221 BC, he was the emperor who unified the uh, seven states of what is now China. It's called the Warring States period. And so in doing my research, I discovered that he needed a ninth cauldron to legitimize his reign because he took the country by force, so now he had to legitimize his claim. So I wrapped my second story around the cauldron. And and the thing about China, there's so many wonderful superstitions and myths, like there's five elemental dragons and sorcerers and magicians. So I could just weave a a lot of those mythical elements into the story, as well as all of the wonderful um, inventions China has made over the years. They had the wheelbarrow a thousand years before it was introduced into Western Europe. And that's the part of research that's fun for me. And if people want to write books, it's important to do the research. Now, to really understand what's going on during that time. That's so exciting because you bring so much of that research in your books that, you know, it, it almost feels like a historical fiction. Well, it is because I do want people to learn a little bit, but they make it fun. And a, a, a man who read my story, because this is a book for men as well as women who love the character, Alex, and for young readers who want an adventure, but especially uh, men I find who've enjoyed it, said that, you know, I read this this passage and it was really interesting, and, and then I realized I learned something too. <laughs> <laughs> well, how exciting is that? My goodness. Well, and so when you're, when you're writing and you're writing these different characters, because we have the main characters, Andrew, Alex, and Angel. So when you're writing uh-huh. these main characters, you know, writing about them, how did that go? Did they kind of um, leap from the page? Did you have a storyline all, already? How did that go? Well, it's interesting how that happens because they do actually come alive after you start working, after I keep saying you, after I start working with them because I'll take it to myself again. Um, so I started out with Alex because he's an adventurer and he has a curiosity about this world and he doesn't mind danger and so he's my adventure character. So with him in my stories, that takes us on the adventure. Then Andrew Seaton is an archaeologist, so he brings in the scientific side, so then I can share everything I've learned uh, about archaeology, and, and that adds depth to my stories with with that character. And then Angel is my metaphysical woman with, who has her own kind of magic. She calls herself a witch because that's the only way she can explain to people who have no clue why things happen for her the way they do. So as she introduces herself to Alex and Andrew to teach them magic and help them to grow and evolve in their lives, she says that what she does is because she's a witch. But then we learn that it's more about self-empowerment and developing the, your own power within yourself. So, so those three characters tell my stories from their points of view. Their perspectives. Yeah, it almost sounds like you were kind of channeling these characters in a way, you know, it's just how your process <laughs> went. You know? It's really fun how that happens because, well, I have a vivid imagination, and so I, for example, I'll set the scene of what needs to happen next, and so then I'll know which characters invo- are involved. And then I just sort of tune into them and and relax my mind and just let the story unfold. Excuse me. <clears throat> so as the scene unfolds, then the characters come to life, as it were, and they start to dialogue. And I know how Andrew sounds. He's British and he's older. He's about 60 and he's kind of that portly grandfather type that that um, I love. I wish he was my grandfather. And Alex then, from his point of view or his perspective, will bring in the action part. And then Angel, of course, is always instructing, not instructing because it's not a lesson, but, you know, helping them to grow and showing them how to do it when with magic. So really, the, the scenes just take off, and I write as fast as I can just to keep up. 
Oh, my goodness. How exciting is that? Well, and so you said, <laughs> because it, it's interesting just how the process goes, and each of these characters have their own voice, right? Yes, they do. And um, I've been told that they do have distinctive voices, at, because I know I can hear it in my head, but it's good to learn from other people that they think the characters are interesting and they enjoy the, the camaraderie and the, the conversations that happen between them and, and how the magic unfolds. Mm-hmm. How it all comes together. Well, and was there any point during your writing that you felt like, gosh, you know, something surprised you or maybe you got stuck a little bit? <laughs> you know, that does happen. Um, and and so what I'll do in a point of concern like that is I will, first I just kind of let it sit for a while. I just back away and just kind of let things sift, sift down, let the dust settle. And then what I'll do is I'll turn the story around. Um, I'll see what I can do to switch the plot around or give the dialogue to a different character. And the funny thing is, a lot of times the characters will think of their own solution and it's better than the one I could have thought of myself. So, so I give them free reign. But in doing that, a, a author also has to have an outline or a storyline of, of where they're going with the story. Because otherwise the characters could go, you know, if you don't have a clear idea of what they are or who they are, could go off on tangents and lead you astray. So the author has to be in control, but then also leave that creative freedom to to let the story unfold in a natural, uh, even better way than um, you started out when you began the story. Oh, that sounds so beautiful. And so what would you like, because we don't, we don't go over the whole book, because obviously it's a novel, and we want everyone to pick up their own copy of A Shadow Away. What would you like to share with us about the book? I know we've been talking about it a little bit, but is there anything additional you'd like to share? Not that I can think of offhand. It's just a good adventure story for someone who wants to have a good read on the beach uh, to relax and be whisked away into another world of imagination. And and um, I, it's just a good. I, I, I like it as a good adventure with a good plot, and great characters, and it's a good, it's a fun read. Yeah, I, I felt it was like a really good book for, you know, we're coming to the close of summer here, but, you know, a really good book for, you know, just kind of summer or sitting at home and, and having the day of reading. And um, did you, when you started out, did you know you were going to write three books? Or was no, it- uh, that's <laughs> funny how that happened. Because I just had this one story that I wanted to tell with everything I'd learned and uh, about science and metaphysics and archaeology and so I, I poured everything in that because I wanted to share all these wonderful things that I'd learned and then um, more ideas started coming like China and everything that I loved about it and and in fact a person said well if you wrote one book you, you should write two so I said well you're right so <laughs> <laughs> I went to the library did my research and and I learned a whole bunch of interesting facts. And the thing about research is you might not use everything, but write everything down that might pertain to your story, and then uh, use what you need, and it will add depth to the story that you want to tell. Oh, that's perfect, because it really does, you know, it's interesting when a book kind of evolves, and the characters evolve, and the plot you know, kind of thickens to the point where you realize, gosh, it's, this has got to be more than just one book. You know, it just kind of, it's fun where that will take you. Uh-huh. And, and so now it's stretched to a series of six. So um, after China, they will be going to uh, into the legend of Atlantis. So I have an alternative uh, to the legend uh, in this Atlantis. It actually survives. There are survivors. And I've researched that some believe that there are people who survived Atlantis, and that's why there are pyramids in Egypt and Mexico that look virtually similar. So that's one theory: is um, is that how that is how that evolved was from Atlantis survivors? So you can weave all kinds of interesting stories out of legends like that. So after Atlantis, then there's a story that will take place in Ireland. So, you know, I love fairies and elves and that magical world of the 
what they call the other world. So I'll weave a story taking in those characters. And then to finish it off, the uh, fifth book will be in Egypt. Got to go to Egypt because they have so many legends and the history there is so full and rich that it's just begging for another story with Egyptian gods and trouble. And then in the sixth oh. book, the, the final book at this point in time, is uh, uh, going to take place first with a, a murder in Los Angeles and then a chase through uh, New Mexico and uh, onto the capitals of Europe, a chase through through those capitals, uh, looking for the treasures of Cibola. And I don't know if readers know about Cibola, but it's called the Seven Cities of Gold that is supposedly lost somewhere in New Mexico. Well, that's one of the places people believe it. I choose to place it there because there's so many legends and rich mythology with the Navajos and the Indian people who live in that area. So uh, that that will be the setting. Uh, even the conquistadors who came through and destroyed central Mexico looking for gold did continue on up into what is now the United States looking for the seven cities of Cibola. So I have rich material for more legends. You do. My goodness, you do. And I cannot wait for you to write the next one. So, <laughs> so much. Um, and where it left off, I, you know, you just want to kind of pick up the next book and start reading it immediately. And I know you're in the works on that. Well, I do have uh, the second book, which is called All Under Heaven, about China and the emperor and the lost ninth cauldron of the house of Zhu. Uh, and the Elemental Dragons. That will come out in September or October. And then the third novel about Atlantis, I'm scheduled to come out next spring. So they're coming. They're they're on their way. They're on the track. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so um, with your writing process, I mean, my goodness, you've got so many um, – and so many things that you've shared with us. What what do you want our readers to take away from this book? I just want them to believe in themselves. And and the main sto- the main thrust of the first story is that if you believe in yourself and you believe with your heart and you um, picture it clearly in your mind exactly what you want. You can make miracles happen. Well, isn't that a good uh, a good story to end on? So, you know, Joan, if people are looking to connect with you, where can they do that to learn not just about this book, but all the books you're writing and be part of your community? Oh, thank you for asking, Marianne. Actually, I do have a website. It's www.joankaylacy, all one word, lowercase, joankaylacy.com. And there's a, on the website is some history about me, my my life so far, and the other books that are that I'm working on, and some interesting blogs. I do write a blog every week, so you, um, the readers and everyone is cordially invited to visit my blog site. I write about everything that interests me there too. So, oh. lots to read. <laughs> Yeah, you you have so many great, I mean, you've got tips for people to develop their characters in their novel. You've got, you know, things that you do because you have a pastime you like to do when you're not writing, right? Yes, I do have other interests. They've all been kind of put on the back shelf now because uh, writing does take my time. And I kind of focus on one thing at a time and that takes all my energy. But when I'm not writing, I love to play the banjo. I'm learning the three finger scrug style bluegrass because I've always loved the sound of a banjo, and I love to play Irish uh, Irish fiddle music. There's a group, uh, there are lots of groups everywhere, uh, communities of people that get together and play, and that's a lot of fun. And I also play the classical violin for technique, and uh, I. I like to play classical music. I don't enjoy listening to it so much, but it's fun to play, especially with, when you're playing with other people. It's it's a great time to share and be together with others. And the other last thing I like to do is spin, because I used to live in Kentucky, and there's the spinning and the crafts of the 
in the past centuries are still popular, and it caught my imagination. So I spin alpaca fiber into yarn, and then I like to knit and crochet also. I've always had to keep my hands busy. So uh, at night, watching TV or whatever, I'll knit or crochet items that I will then donate to the VA hospital. Oh, well, that's that's just so amazing. And I'm just so intrigued with all the things you do. And gosh, your blog is such a great resource for new writers because you share there your storyboard and you've got a little video about that and other ways that you also um, you give tips for writers as far as things to consider, which, you know, I think is really important. And you're very, um, you're very open about all that information. Well, yes, I'd love to share and give back because much has been given to me and I want other people to grow and prosper and, and be happy in their lives. And also besides writing, I wrote about that a lot at first because that's what I knew and and people who were telling telling me how to start a blog because I had no clue. I was write about the things I know. So that's why a lot of these blogs in the beginning are about writing. But I'm going to be branching out. In fact, I have an, uh, my next article will be about LIDAR and the new techniques that archaeologists are using to find these wonderful lost cities that we had no clue because we couldn't see through the canopy of trees. But the LIDAR that uh, focuses through the trees to the ground beneath, beneath so that if there's a hump in the ground where there's an old building, it will show up on these x-ray pictures lack of a better word to call them. So they're just discovering hundreds of pictures of rewriting history right now in, in Central America and Peru. They had no idea there was so much uh, civilization in Peru and that there were many, many more people living there than we ever believed possible. And that's what I love about as we learn about our world is we never gave the early civilizations credit for the travel that they did, the exploring, the exchange of trades and goods and and uh, beliefs. And so the world is a the magical, wonderful place that is wonderful to explore, and I just wanted to open people to that possibility. Well, you definitely open the doors for many people to, you know, explore writing, to explore that you know, in your books, the journey that you have that's kind of ma- magical and mystical, and it's this big adventure that they can go on as well. And, and so I give you lots of credit and kudos for all the work you're doing, Joan. I mean, I think you did such a fabulous job with this book. Thank you. Thank you very much. That means a lot. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we were able to spend this time today together and to talk about your book, A Shadow Away. So, Joan, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Marianne. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a joy. Well, thank you, Joan. I can't wait for your next book to come out. And when it does, we have to have you back on the show to talk about it. Well, again, if you'd like to connect with Joan Lacey, you can at her website, joanklacey.com. Her book is available on Amazon. And of course, check out her website for all the great updates she has, including information on her upcoming books. I've uh, connected with Joan on social media and highly suggest you do the same. Her posts and articles are extremely informative. If you have a suggestion for the show, please reach out to us at momentswithmarianne.com or you can email me directly at marianne at mariannepastana.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. 
A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.